Okay, right, so this, this is uh, English boxwood, which is, uh, I believe, um, Buick's uh, wood of choice. And uh, the examples here are from the Chilterns. Boxwood grows particularly well on chalky ground, apparently. Um, so the Chilterns is an ideal source for boxwood. Um, the big log in the middle is probably around 300 year old, so growing uh, when Buick was alive, which is a nice thought. Okay. So th this is lemon wood, which is uh, also known as Castello boxwood. It's a South American timber. Um, I'm not entirely sure when it was first used for wood engraving, but I think T.N. Lawrence, the firm of T.N. Lawrence, the, um, the, the, the block makers from the 1860s until quite recently, um, introduced it into their catalogue as far as I know in the 1970s. Um, it's not a true boxwood, um, it's uh, known as Castello boxwood because it has similar properties. Um, it's also used for longbows. Um, myself as a block maker and the longbow makers in this country are the only people who use lemon wood. It has uh, great elastic properties. The, the first stage in uh, block making is to slice up your log of boxwood or whatever wood you're using um, into um, uh, slices of about 25-26 millimetres uh, to allow for machining to then get you down to type high. Um, so we're basically slicing up like a, like a cucumber. That would be a typical slice of boxwood in terms of um, quality and um, the kind of defects you have to work around. Um, that side's a little bit better. Um, so the next stage then would be to extract from around uh, the usable pieces of wood. Clearly that split section there is waste. Uh, these are not really desirable. These are um, uh, this is damage to the wood that's happened at the uh, around the bark, and this is the wood trying to heal itself. But unfortunately, they they produce uh, crumbly uh, elements, so they they can't be used. So out of this, on this side, we have a clean section. And uh, what I would do next is to just uh, draw it on. Would be to um, draw on. Uh, like that so out, out of that round of boxwood that that's the the usable area and uh, if I'm making a block of any size out of boxwood it has to be constructed from several pieces uh, such as this they have to be carefully jointed together before I can go on to the next stage which would be leveling it to type high and then polishing okay. I'll, just, I'll show you an example so that's a it's an example of a finished block yeah so this is this is a finished boxwood block which is constructed from one, two, three, four, five different sections. The joints have to be completely um, invisible, or, or the, well, you can see them, but you can't. You shouldn't be able to feel them with your nail, otherwise any line there will show up in the print. So that's an important um, element of making a composite block. Okay. So this is a section from a very old engraving block that I've um, uh, that I'm sort of reprocessing um, it would have had some kind of uh, trade engraving on, on the surface which I've milled off um, and, and taken apart um, the interesting thing here is that this is a, an example of uh, a composite block that was joined together with um, <coughs> brass bolts so that the um, a large block which would have uh, the drawing or the photograph of the image on it could be then taken apart and uh, a section would be given to each engraver in the workshop um, they would engrave their bit um, and then uh, when everyone had finished the block would be then rejoined by means of the, the bolts that would be put in and it would be locked up tight 
and uh, the master engraver would then come along and very carefully engrave the seams so that uh, it looked as if it was one uh, complete and continuous wood engraving. Uh, extraordinarily, extraordinary level of skill involved in doing that. Almost certainly these have been engraved with a ruling machine. That's a pit head. Yeah. So it is. Yeah. And more there. Mm. These would have been then made into electrotypes for, for printing, which is why the backgrounds haven't been cleared. So the electrotypes would be made and then they'd be cut out and mounted on a block of wood for printing. But all of this um, it's not too apparent from the appearance of the block but if I was to take a print from that the uh, the linear work and the curves here are so perfect they could really only have been done by machine by something called a ruling machine entry after the advent of the half tone printing block um, it's just that uh, companies who wanted their items reproduced in catalogues I think had a preference for the engraved image because it was more crisp and showed off the uh, precision of the machine better than a, a softer half-tone photograph. Hmm. This is um, the inking process. Always use an oil-based ink for wood engraving um, and the one that's specifically made for relief printmaking which will be stiffer than other oil based inks because you want the ink to stay on the surface of the block. And getting the right level of ink is very important. It's crucial not to over ink a block. Hopefully, um, I'll just move all this gunk out of the way so it looks a bit more respectable. Okay, right. I think that hopefully there's enough ink on there. Might have to do a little bit of um, sleight of hand when it comes to. Right. So, so this particular paper that I'm using is uh, uh, came to me. By Monica Poole when, when she died I got her printing press it's just the one we're using now as well as a, a good stash of handmade Japanese papers um, I'm doing this kind of ad hoc really Not, normally you would set up the block and the, um, and the paper registration if you're doing an addition for a few seconds, known as the printer's kiss. We've skipped the actual peeling off. Oh, you've got a bit of that, haven't you? I've got a bit of the peeling Yeah, yeah, and then let me just show the, the finished print. And this is? This is uh, the bridge at Aero Force which apparently is where we think Wordsworth was inspired to write the Daffodils poem near Ullswater. So and were you credited on the... No, I wasn't credited, oh. but, but I was paid quite handsomely oh, for well, this job. Right, yeah. 
because the initial job was just to produce engravings for advertisements that would go in the Belgian press to promote tourism to the UK. And then at some point down the line, they decided to make posters out of them. And so I got additional. <laughs> they wanted a style of illustration that was um, characteristically British, which is why they chose wood engraving. Many years after she gave me the only advice I ever had on wood engraving, which was to never bandage forms. In other words, never engrave a line following the form of an object. Uh, you, you create the sense of roundness by hatching and creating ever um, lighter tones across the form. <laughs> Um, so th this um, this one this marked the uh, I'll take it out of the wrapper there. Sorry. So wh why I think this one's it's interesting for me is because uh, this marked a, a departure in my work from um, naturalism to a more abstracted style. Mm -hmm. I mean, you might want to home in on that. that that's an example of the way I had been working. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. Yeah? Mm -hmm. A few years ago when um, I had a bad cold and I wasn't feeling like doing any work, so I was reading books and watching videos on cubism and uh, um, decided a uh, hundred years after the event that I'd try my hand at cubism <laughs> um, and just sat drawing what I could see in front of me in the living room just my beloved Bedlington Terrier and the, my banjo that I never play and various other elements um, <laughs> so the initial drawing was, was that which then became reduced and sort of fine-tuned to that which was then traced down onto the block. You can see the fold lines there, where the drawing is folded over the block. And uh, it's also an example of a, a two colour wood engraving, which is something I've been uh, working on um, two, three, four, five colours, in fact. Um, so this is a simple two colour image. And these are the blocks, which have to register perfectly both in the cutting and in the printing in order to get perfect registration. Something, I mean, good. yeah, okay, yeah. Um, so, this is a, an example of um, uh, it's a wood engraving by Gertrude Hermes. Uh, water lilies. Uh, as far as I know it's not an illustration though it may be. Uh, it could be just an independent print and uh, it's a wonderful example of wood engraving liberated from the shackles of uh, reprographic um, methods. So this is um, this is the engraver just um, relishing the, the beauty of the marks an engraving tool can make in a piece of boxwood. Um, you can see here these uh, marks with the graver where the line swells and uh, these sensuous curves oh. and then the, the velvety blacks of the untouched wood and the clean whites, the contrasting shapes. It's a book that the Society of Wood Engravers um, produced for their as part of their centenary, the doomed centenary of lockdown year, and uh, this is called 2020 Vision by the printed by Nomad Letter Press, which I think is Pat Randall's press, and uh, so 19 wood engravers. It's the collection of Nigel Hamway in Oxford, a great patron of the Society of Wood Engravers, and. Uh, it's 19 wood engravers, some of whom are former chairman of the society, uh, with a, 
an engraving that shows the influence or inspiration of either the teacher or one of the engraving heroes. Um, so I'll just I'll just find the one I did for yeah. So this is a uh, this is my tribute to Monica Poole, who's who was probably the nearest thing I had to a, a teacher, even though I never met her. It was the guidance I got from her was only by correspondence when I was starting off as a wood engraver. And, uh, so this is my tribute to Monica uh, when she told me never to bandage forms, always create a form by cross-hatching to create ever lighter and lighter tones through multiple layers of hatching, which is something that if you look at her work you'll see she does all the time. So something like 35, 40 years after getting her advice, I finally put it into practice with this one. Okay. Bandage forms. And by bandaging, she meant something that's found very often in the work of Richard Shirley Smith. Mm -hmm. Someone whose work I greatly admire. He no longer engraves, but uh, there's a considerable body of his work for us to enjoy and Richard is someone who very definitely bandaged forms um, let me just find a good example of bandaging uh, so an example of bandaging would be where the engraved line curves to describe the form and uh, in this instance curves masterfully there to describe the, the calf so it's, it's got starting here and following the line and then curving round at the edge uh, and the portrait as well um, so numerous examples in Richard Shirley Smith's work of bandaging uh, and seeing the locks of the hair how the, the lines taper and swell So if you contrast this with Monica Poole's work, bear with me a second, Peter. Um, so when when Monica's um, describing forms, rounded forms, it's all by means of um, a tonal variation that's created by straight lines, areas of white, cross hatching and the edges to create secondary and tertiary tones here as well um, all of this um, description of form is all done by means of straight lines here as well yeah so yeah, well, I think the, enough to make the point anyway that um, two distinct ways of of creating forms was born in England and moved to America, I think, as a young boy, and uh, became apprenticed as a trade engraver, and then um, was sent to Europe to make engravings of old master paintings for reproduction in American art journals um, at a time when travel wasn't so easy to Europe. So he was, um, he developed this extraordinary technique um, of um, rendering oil paint um, in, in terms of wood engraving. Extraordinary. Um, my guess is that the images he was working on were photographed onto the block and he was engraving the photograph which is quite a common practice. I just get so I just find some more that I think are really quite extra well they're all extraordinary but uh yeah this as well. So that's a an engraving of a presumably a watercolour by John Sell Cotman. A uh, beautiful example of how wood engraving can be very fluid. Um, what's noticeable about 
these engravings, certainly from a wood engraver's point of view, is there are no outlines anyway, and nothing is outlined. The, the lines um, just merge into other lines of different weight to uh, define a form. So this this um, boat in the distance has no outlines. If you look closely at it, it's just just where the lines. Um, thin out and then open out again on the other side of the mast. Similarly here the edge of the boat doesn't have an edge just the, the line describing the sky in the background just becomes a very faint dotted line and that, that faint dotted line describes the edge of the boat so um, it's a beautiful um, engraving technique here that maybe only wood engravers would appreciate um, different kind of image if that had been purely a photograph so it's a good point I'm guessing because a lot of these would have been done after the invention of the half tone plate um, that they, they, they must have preferred um, the quality of image that the engraving produced right Word. yeah um, I'll try and find before we go I'll try and find the portfolio of uh, um, his originals, but these are from the block. I mean, there's no doubt about that. And this, interestingly, was written by his son Alphaeus Cole, who himself was a wood engraver. In fact, he did the portrait of his father as the frontispiece, and it's actually signed by him. Now, Alphaeus Cole, um, when he died in I think 1988, was the oldest man on record. He was 112 and was in the Guinness Book of Records as the oldest man alive. Gracious. So, yeah. what engravings obviously good for you. That's, that's Alphaeus' engraving of his father at work. Hmm. Again, it's another example of no outlines anywhere. Hmm. That's, just, that's just where lines stop to, to define an edge, hmm. whether it's lines or whether it's stippled hmm. marks. Mm -hmm. Um, around the edge of the shoulder it's just where the background stippling stops mm 